lives and what is possible today through your activity, Amber, with uh, the fabricants, uh, which is new, no, a new uh, uh, digital studio, total fashion digital studio that we're going to define, and Alex, uh, who is uh, an artist, music artist, who uh, for long years you you still uh, work with uh, your band, Chicks on Speed, that you founded in 1997, that is at the crossover of many fields, music, but also arts and uh, graphic design and digital culture, and uh, you mixed up together, everything together with always making big projects with a lot of talents involved in your projects. And, um, but maybe before going into your, both your respective activities, we should maybe define uh, what means metaverse and uh, that topic that was a bit still very abstract i mean a few months ago but since maybe facebook developed it uh, i mean decided to invest millions of dollars uh, in uh, developing that activities and uh, creating actually a lot of employment in europe about that it becomes more concrete with more business input in that and um, myself, what I would understand, what I had understood, but maybe you will correct if I'm wrong, but it was a bit the meeting point between the gaming business or the gaming activity and Facebook. So Amber. to make it simple. <laughs> Let's, I'd love to know what Amber thinks. How do you define the metaverse? Yeah, I mean, it's very hard to define, right? Because we're still building it, but I think the metaverse is not per se one place. A lot of people think it's gonna be one place where we can go and meet up. I think metaverse basically means that, the, that it, there's like meta levels to our existence. Um, we're actually already living in a metaverse when you see how much we are on, are on Instagram or any other social media platform in our lives. These are also metaverses that we are, enter into and that we sort of populate with our identity. But that's all 2D, that's all web 2.0, that's all .com, that's all where you just are just scrolling, but you're not really walking, or you're not really 3D present in the space. I think what, what Facebook has done is sort of shown um, what, uh, what a metaverse could look like, um, which I think is very good for the bigger sense of the populace to understand what this could be. But I think metaverse is actually going to be different places where we can go. It's like you would meet up in a certain metaverse and you would have your identity there. Like for instance, um, you would go to a metaverse like Decentraland, which is quite famous now. Um, it's a decentralized uh, system, so it means it's built on a blockchain. Um, all very complicated words, but what it means is that uh, basically it is not authorized by a central power, but it's with all kinds of decentralized people deciding on the fate of the metaverse itself and when you meet there you choose your avatar you choose your wearables like the clothing that you will wear basically and you present yourself as a 3d object in the space you can walk around you can meet people um, but basically we've already been living in metaverses in the past years and now it's just going to come into fruition into a 3d space where we'll be able to express our emotions there's now even vr glasses that record your emotional expression so when you enter into the world you can see like what your emotions are which is very important so there's going to be more and more and more of this but it's not one place i think it will be a several so yeah how would you define yeah, it Alex, i like this that it's several metaverses because um, i had an experience with chicks on speed recently well mm -hmm. actually two years ago we performed in a metaverse in the Ars electronica festival in Linz, and they built a cruise ship, and it was an abandoned cruise ship in the metaverse. And so we performed in one of these spaces, um, and that was a really interesting experience because yeah, we could wear these sort of um, alter ego type masks and um, reach a lot of different people and network with a lot of different people. So now, uh, through that experience, we've found that telematic performance. Uh, enables us to perform with people all over the world. And so one concert, for example, won't be just five of us on stage, we'll have multiple people joining us, you know, in this network sort of scenario. So I feel like this metaverse 
opens up a lot of possibilities of collaboration, whether that be costume, because we'd love to work with Amber in the future. We'll talk about that, about that maybe um, yeah. very democratizing possibilities by Metaverse with participating, uh, co-creating activities, uh, either with brands or with artists. And maybe that's good that maybe you introduce us what is the fabric and timber uh, that the, the, the new fashion digital studio that you founded, but you are in, fas in digital fashion since your studies because you did the first fashion dress when you were a student already, maybe the first one in the world. And then you take on the fabricant, and we would like you to explain us very well what is this maybe co-creating approach of the fabricant. So maybe we we will do this little presentation. Yeah, sure. Um, I think like like starting with because so I think what you what I really love about what you said is the co-creation. Yeah, if we can see, we can get the presentation up. Um, oh, yes, below there. On the bottom. <laughs> I can talk and then we can sort of move from there. Because um, I think um, what I love about this co collaboration that you said is this uh, the fact that, yes, there we go. Cool, amazing. Yeah, so we can work together, and that's very beautiful because from now what you said as well, Alex, is like from a distance you can actually go collaborate on the same things. Like there would be different files other people are working on. Um, yeah, it, it just it's all a story about we work together with an artist from the US who sent us her Unreal environment, which is just like a 3D environment, and we were able to place our garment inside of her environment and yeah create visuals with that which i think is something that we've never seen before in fashion like that easily and that fast to connect from all over the world um but yeah the fabricant is we're a digital fashion house we create clothing um yeah that is always digital and never physical and um yeah we basically try to waste nothing but data and obviously data is still wastage but um it's at least not creating more clothes and more piles and piles of stuff we try to see how we can dress uh, this new identity, the new ways that we are going to present, present ourselves in this world. And especially after the pandemic, um, people realized like, that we are more and more online every single day and our identity is becoming more important. Um, and I think this is something that we, we didn't really take into account until the pandemic came because then we really couldn't leave our house anymore. But it, actually, I think it was pretty good because then we also realized we don't need that much travel and we don't need that much stuff. Um, so, yeah, the thing you see here in the back um, is the dress that we sold in 2019. Um, it is a dress that was sold at an auction, digital only dress. Um, before we created this dress, the fabricant was kind of seen as, okay, it's funny, it's kind of a nice project that you guys create, you know you know having fun um but we we always thought it's very serious business and for me as well like as a student i just was thinking like what can we do to create this new world without um having to create as much materials and i think um yeah after graduating with a digital collection this was sort of the way i wanted to move forward and um, meeting the right people led me to create the fabricate together with two co-founders in 2018 and um, this dress we created for an auction, uh, for an Ethereum conference. Who knows what blockchain is? Can I see some hands? Yes. Who knows what NFTs are? Yes, cool. Yeah, now you don't have to technically understand it because I also don't to a certain way, but um, basically what it says, it's a unique item. So this dress you see in the back was the first dress um, that ever sold as an NFT. So. In 2019, nobody really knew what that meant. And I don't know if you guys know the value of ETH right now, but one ETH is about 4,000 right now, it's about euro, 4,000 euros. And so the value of this has way gone up since uh, those times, but we sold this dress back then for 54 ETH, which is absolutely crazy. 
but it was $9,500 back then, so. But still, to get $9,500 for a dress that never physically existed, that you couldn't touch, you couldn't feel, you couldn't physically wear, the owner could only wear it online, you know, the, that stopped the press, that stopped the whole world. People were like, is this serious? Like, what's happening here? Like, is this what the world has come to? And um, it was also a reckoning moment for fashion because suddenly, you know, as, as most of these influencers online, you know, you're an influencer, you get close trip to your house, you basically try something on and you take a picture and you wear it on Instagram and then you, you know, you don't wear it anymore. You just wear it once. And I think this new technology really allows for you, for you to express yourself, all your multiple selves, all, your, all the ways you want to express yourself without it having to have the environmental impact. Um, so yeah, this dress we sold back then and then suddenly people took it seriously. And ever since then we've been doing all kinds of projects with, uh, in relation to creating this digital identity and how do we curate ourselves in this world. And I think if you can go next slide, please. Um, we landed on the cover of Vogue in September, uh, Vogue Singapore. This is the first Vogue cover ever to be sold as an NFT. And um, we did this together with Siobhan Wong, who's a very famous, she also was uh, curating the section together with me. She's a famous crypto artist. Um, she was a fashion photographer, but turned crypto artist during the pandemic. She reschooled herself in creating avatars. Um, which I think is a very beautiful thing to do because right now she's way more profitable from her crypto art than she ever was from her photography. Um, so yeah, it, this landed on the cover of Vogue, which was to us also pretty insane that this movement made it that far. And But we're not stopping, you know, and, and the thing is this whole uh, section I think is also a very beautiful expression of that. Um, and if you can go to the next slide. Yeah, we, we also create AR layers and AR clothes. So here you can see, um, yeah, the model wearing our uh, dress. And on the other side, you see the NFT that belongs to the dress as well. And you can now wear this. Like if you go to Snapchat and look for the fabricant, you can wear this right now. And I think that's the beauty, beauty of digital fashion. You have immediate um, uh, creation and immediate wearability, which is something that in fashion you don't really see. You have to order it and it comes later and wait for it. And even with creating collections, right? Fashion is sort of two years in front. Like they have to think two years in front to make sort of collections and predict and all those kind of things. But digital fashion, you can immediately translate what is going on in the world. Like all these collections that were not prepared for the pandemic to come and were sort of not in style anymore because nobody could predict that. In digital fashion, you immediately can translate that into something that makes sense for the moment right now. So that's why I think it's so relevant uh, to fashion because in a way, fashion is this moment translation of the zeitgeist into emotion. And we could do that with the technology. There is just one yeah. point I wanted to highlight when uh, we were talking about uh, uh, the first impression we could feel when we, we wear a digital garment, digital dress, digital design. Uh, I had this experience with a VR experience made by a choreographer, Blancali. She did a whole show, a whole VR show, in which she had made a collaboration with Chanel and all the participants who they were collectively participate to this immersive experience. They had first to pick up one outfits, one uh, from Chanel, and we had a choice between different garments. And it's true that when you were, it was actually um, a tailor uh, for men, uh, made by Chanel, when you were wearing, so you, you pick up it, and suddenly you have it on yourself. And it's a very strong emotion. Mm. Because basically we, we kind of feel uh, the feeling of a real garment on us. Maybe you can tell us about that emotion that is quite close to the emotion we would feel if we were dressed, wearing the, the real dress actually, or the real uh, outfit. So yeah. the emotion is quite close and we can experiment different feelings. We would uh, maybe more easily experiment than trying to get, uh, to make it in real life. 
I love that you say that, because and I love that you had that experience because that really proves the point. I think of what we're trying to do and. When you can wear something digitally, it can also make you feel different ways, right? It can, because right now you're wearing a suit, which is also the emotion of, of wearing it, experiencing it. But what if you could wear like different bodies or suddenly you'd, you'd wear a dress or how would you feel when you wear those kind of things? And how would you feel to be able to change your identity every single minute? And I think that's something that we haven't really experienced because you choose one outfit in the morning, which you wear maybe most of the time all day, or you might go to an event in the evening and get dressed in a different look. But most of the time, that is about the outfits that we can do. Uh, about that, I don't the, the question of identity. It's also maybe Alex, you have a, a point of view on that. Even if we go through all the different experiences you did with ships and speed, and even your research uh, on that topic, but. Uh, the, the central question that I had about all that talk was do we express actually our own identity or do we express another identity or maybe mm. uh, that's, I mean, is it an amplification of everything or is it another experience of is it another ourselves? <laughs> I think when you're a performer, you, you put on a costume and, and you become a different identity. It's, it's almost like this um, embodying this alter ego, if you like. And so every costume will create a different alter ego. And there's such a, a tradition in uh, performance art and just art in general, like Duchamp creating Rose Sennonier, the character, um, who he performed in many <coughs> letters or photographs or Lynn Hirschman Leeson creating an alter ego that she performed for like four years straight and she was able to become another person because she felt that in the world that she lived in that she couldn't be the feminist that she wanted to be or be um, treated in a certain way. And um, and I think that we as Chicks on Speed and Melissa just there <laughs> from Chicks on Speed, the partner that I, my partner in Chicks on Speed I've worked with for around 21 years, um, we play a lot of alter egos and we really see this as um, an extension, no? an artistic extension, but it's through costume. And now with the possibility of this sort of digital only object, is that what you call it, Amber? I remember during our conversation, it enables us to play even more characters in this augmented space. So this becomes another layer and that, a layer of expression and it's very interesting. Yeah, yeah, I think that's what fascinated me as a kid. I could endlessly dress my characters in The Sims. To me, that was like an expression of myself, you know, and then I was expressing myself in that way. And you could do that in physical space by dressing yourself di differently every day. But it was a yeah. fantasy of yourself, or it was your, uh, what you wanted to really express of yourself. I mean, yeah, that's a, really it's a very fine line. This feels so difficult, right? Because, you know, for me, like even your fantasy expression is also you. Mm -hmm. Like what makes it different that it's a fantasy? Because if we have the means to do so, like why wouldn't we um, give ourselves elf ears or crazy orange eyes or, or a, a purple skin instead of trying to enhance the things that we have in real life? Um, why wouldn't we experiment with these new levels of identity? And this can just as well be you, like who says that you can't be a cloud? Mm -hmm. If you want to be a cloud and you feel like that represents your identity, like why can't you be that? And I think, you know, it's, it, it opens up this really philosophical discussion that I love this because it sort of, it goes beyond like what is beyond our, our physical body, even though I feel like we are very well need to be embodied in our body because a lot of people are very much in their minds and I do believe that embodiment is very important. But if we go into this digital world, like what still, what can we embody in that space and how does that feel? How does it feel to have arms that are four meters long so you can scratch someone else's head over there? You know, like those kind of things we, we never experienced, but now we can. And I think that's so interesting. So, yeah. And uh, maybe to go through the fabricant again, uh, maybe you could tell us more about this co-creating pr process yeah, uh, sure. layout you, you developed. Yeah, maybe if you go to the next slide. Because it's a big mutation, it's a big transformation of it the is. relationship between the brand and uh, the consumer. 
Totally. So we see that we want to, we want to create a fashion world 3.0, in which we believe that it's no longer us deciding what people are going to wear, but everybody has the agency to decide on what they want to design, what they want to create, and what they want to wear. And we call this a decentralized fashion house, basically. And it means that there is no longer one top-down uh, sort of person who's saying, okay, this is what the collection will look like, this is what we're going to do, and none of the designers are being credited that work in this house and all those kind of things. Um, we believe that everybody has their own artistic expression and that we should allow for that. So if you can go to the next slide and show a little bit of this co-creation. Um, so what you see here in the back is basically a combination of our designs, uh, designs from another brand, Dickies, and designs from several um, uh, uh, fashion designers. So this is uh, on the back you see um, Hade, who is from Ghana, and you see Taskin, who is from Berlin, and Zemenje, who is from uh, China. And uh, they basically created these garments, and they were white canvas garments. And if you went onto the platform, this is the platform that we're developing, you could cho choose a white canvas garment that you wanted, choose a fabric that you like, and this fabric could be created by any uh, crypto creator or any artist that designs this fabric. And then you, you combine those into an item that will look like this. And this you can mint on the blockchain. And then later on you can sell. And the idea is that all of the people that are involved in this get credited and profit of it. Because um, the garment designer, for instance, get 30%, the material designer gets 30%, and then the person who put the two together also gets 30%, um, and then the platform takes 10%. So the idea is really when you sell this item, everybody that worked on it will be credited and they will be paid for it and also have endless royalties on it. So when it gets sold and sold and sold, people can create these new economies and these new little economical models for themselves and they can upload their designs on it. And you know, it's just a lot of fun because suddenly you can co-create from all over the world. Choose a design that you like and create your fabric and create something that someone else would have never created, but it's your creation and you can wear it in the metaverse. And what you see here as well is there's also some wearables that you can wear in Sandbox, which is this very pixelized, you can see it over there. There's a very pixelized metaverse and one of the, the designs that you, that we did is also translated there, so we have a partnership with them. So if you create a garment on our platform, you can immediately wear that in the sandbox as well. So, and many more metaverses to come. So it's a really new model. It's a new model and it's a new relationship in terms of power between brands and consumers. Because yes. now consumers, they can, they can have a freedom and a power they didn't have about creating themselves and being also some dealers. Yeah, yeah, because consumers like actually we don't use the word consumer anymore. We say the the word co-creator. Co-creator. Yeah, yeah. So we we love actually calling them creators or co-creators because we believe that they're creating it with us. Mm -hmm. We're not only the ones deciding in it, but everybody is deciding on it. I mean, it's a new concept of brand, which is not only a, an editor, but you know, who is a creative producer. Yes. In the end, of yes. everyone. Totally. That's, that's more the concept. Yeah. It's not about directing, but producing. Exactly. And also, you're, you're yeah. I find it so amazing, because I mean, it's like you're revolutionizing the fashion industry, which used to just be about the sole creator. You know, and now you're you're giving credit to all of these different people and making it very uh, a democratic process. And I think this is just amazing. The thing I, I would I would like to know about also would be the sustainability aspects that you were speaking about before and how the minting process and how this can become more sustainable minting. I remember you were telling me a little bit about this. Yeah, because yeah, you might think, because um, a lot of their NFTs have had a lot of bad press. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, but it's very bad for the environment. It depends on which blockchain you talk about. So if you talk about Bitcoin and if you talk about Ethereum, then yes, definitely there is uh, ecological consequences. There's a lot of CO2 being produced by that, a lot of power. Not to say that scrolling on Instagram does not, you know, have the same amount of impact, but we don't talk about that. Um, but what's very important is that this platform is built on Flow, which is a proof-of-stake blockchain, which means that all of the um, uh, transactions are basically created by people who put in sums of money instead of uh, having to use so much power. So it's 99.9% .9 
more sustainable than a blockchain um, like Ethereum. And it's sort of, um, yeah, a very interesting new uh, blockchain that was developed by a company called Dapper Labs. And you can build apps on this. So it basically said there's no transaction fees and all this kind of things on this. And we thought that was very important for accessibility for everyone. That people don't have to pay high prices to mint their items, but they can do it for free. And Alex? Yeah. <laughs> it would be nice that you explain us more about your, your background uh, from Shields and Speed, but also now as a digital performer and researcher, yeah. your relationship between performance and art and Shields and Speed. Shields and Speed, sorry. Uh, it's all about a lot of ideas you develop through um, bands that was also influenced by some performing artists like from the Fluxus movement and everything. Whereas this idea of co-creating and uh, networks and maybe you can explain us more about that. <laughs> and uh, maybe we can have some pictures of uh, yeah, the next Alex and Shiks of Speed and Melissa. Maybe Melissa, you'd like to join and me Melissa, for this. If you want we, to. We didn't find you before. <laughs> Do you want to pull up a seat? So Melissa Logan is now joining us. Melissa is part of Co-founder of Cheeks on Speed. Co-founder of Cheeks on Speed. So just to... Some of you know Cheeks on Speed here. Yeah, one. <laughs> Hi. Would be nice. Yeah, thank you for this uh, amazing presentation. It's... Um, yeah, really I'm very amazing. interested in the model that you're working with, the uh, uh, co-creating, and yeah, this is also, this definitely connects with our group, and I mean, I have to say our group was a lot of us for a while, but it is difficult to have a large group in that way, so I like this model of the business structure, having a company structure, and then the co-creators can, you can open up the door to a huge amount of people that can also be uh, independent and also take part when they want to or not be forced to, or I don't know, all the weird things that gets also in group work a lot of times, so. <laughs> um, so I think we, we work in the realm of digital performance and the digital has always been very present in what we're doing. And actually before the lockdown, we were actually doing a lot of telematic <clears throat> work. Um, some of these performances had invited uh, performers who would come in on various platforms, whether that was like Skype or whatever it happened to be at the time, and things have evolved a lot more now. So we're using um, Soundjack and other um, networking sort of softwares, or even on Zoom combined with other low latency sort of systems like Lola. But so we were working in this field of networked performance before, and um, but it's become even more present now. And, I received a research grant that Melissa and I now work on out of uh, NTNU, the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, and it's there that we're able to work with a lot of different researchers and bring together sort of fields of, of art, of fashion, of digital fashion, uh, augmented reality, and um, in different stages around the world. So it is very much about uh, working in real-time telematic audiovisual performance. And that is a larger Gesamtkunstwerk somehow, that is the all-encompassing artwork within a sort of digital mediated space. So these performances that happen between locations, and we're really hoping that next year that we can all collaborate here with uh, Diane on S1214 and do one of these blended performances. And wear the beautiful fashion of Amber and the Fabricant. Yeah. Um, so these blended performances um, happen between different venues. And there's a calibration so that what you do in one space can actually affect the other space because you're all working with the same sort of parameters of these sort of uh, camera uh, systems. And um, so what we're building at the moment are instruments. You can see some of these object instruments like the hat and the high heel shoe guitar. And we're wanting to enable a correspondence over networks with these instruments. And so this will also have an augmented um, layer and we call them object instruments. And Melissa's currently also, as part of that project, working on a heartbeat that will enable sensing and almost like um, to be able to jam with somebody's heartbeat across networks. And sometimes they cross over. <laughs> and you create a certain synergy and you have a different feeling uh, with the person across the network. 
So these are all things that we feel that costume can also enable, whether that's an augmented costume or... Which is costume. the exterior and then the heartbeat being the interior of the body. So this, yeah, this sense that technology is outside and cold and apart can also then actually be hacked when you go to the body interior and start to use the, um, you can use that, the heartbeat, but then also the flow of the blood or you know, different, um, different activity of the body to um, also, yeah, color or to pulse or, yeah, or then to make sounds. So it's, it's very interesting, also very strange when, um, yeah, having the heartbeat, for example, then um, you realize uh, parts and activities about oneself. For example, when one thinks about doing something that already the heartbeat starts to speed up and energize the body with blood flow from the idea in the mind, and then there's like seconds later then the action takes place. So yeah, things like that one can do then. Um, with the costumes then, so another yeah, person could ones. feel what you're feeling. And so we're working with these sort of stethoscopes. Melissa started working with a stethoscope to pick up the heartbeat, but then send that and somebody else will have some sort of a trigger um, on some part of the body. So you get this network sort of sensing going on and we th think that the augmented costume can somehow participate in this yeah so fashion doesn't have to cover up it can also be very exposing the next slide oh, the next one the next one oh this one uh, yeah this is our nft <laughs> in the metaverse and this was very inspired by i gave the interview with amber for diane uh, that's now online, I believe. And um, Amber said, uploading the human. And I was like, wow, that is such a great line. And so we made a whole song, and it's really, <laughs> Amber, you really inspired us with all, a lot of the lyrics and, yeah. and this image. Yeah. Uh, we, we talked about uh, the connection you could do, and we couldn't project ourselves in what you could invent today as a as a creator and the emotions you can transmit from new ways uh, to your audience. But did you experiment this, what happens with the fabricant here, this co-creation co co approach of, uh, yeah. of your performances? Yeah. So this is with very, music and absolutely, this is very, yeah, thank you for reminding me, because this is very much at the core of Im improvisation. Core, so exactly, to, to collaborate, yeah. So collaboration is very much part of everything that we we do and have done, and but so even the, with the yeah. Oh, you mean the participatory? Yes, um, we've always had participation and networked and, Zoom. Okay. And I mean, an example, I guess, I think of right away. Remember the apps, oh, the yeah. iPad apps, where we had three apps that were um, where the audience would where the audience would do the visuals of the performance with apps in the audience. And there was, there was some interesting times also where the um, audience would take over performances and start to, we had a graffiti app, so it was basically a spray paint app um, on an iPad and it was in the audience and then they would spray paint a background and there was, um, it was in Australia, there was the mouth. The men, remember the island, this whole um, catastrophe happening with human rights and then that people, is, that is island. yeah, and then we had like basically a political online, um, a political battle happening in the background of a performance about yeah human rights issues and immigration issues. And so we also through that developed different um, object instruments in the app that people basically took over the show because I think that's important about Chicks and Speed. It is about this very improvised element where sometimes it's not controlled by us as the performers on stage, but that the audience actually starts the beat, changes what we're doing, and we have to respond to that in real time. And that's where I think the networked performance is interesting because it enables this sort of jam session. And jamming comes out of music, it comes out of fluxes, performances, and it is about not controlling things but responding. And I think for the times that we're living in now with our climate catastrophe and things like this, it is about responding and learning how to improvise together to respond and I believe that art can really help and ways of collaborating can help in this that if we come together 
that we can make change. And I, I think that through art and fashion, we're a part of this. You know? And music. And also with the NFTs and blockchain, this crediting of a group of people very uh, clearly and forever. This is, this is, this is invaluable. This technology and people complaining about the gas and about environmental issues. This has to be taken care of. But this is really by being in the music business, jumping out of art school, jumping into music. It was such a liberation, and now music has been squelched down by gatekeepers or by you know a different industry siphoning off. So. A blockchain is definitely, you know, this freedom, like what you are doing with fashion about, yeah, gatekeeping of what is in, what's not, which companies can be successful. This is exactly a parallel in the music world that we see happening and really the opportunity for something that could really revive an industry that has been squelched. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Applause for that. Yeah. <laughs> I so agree, I couldn't agree more. I think what we're seeing now with this new technology called blockchain is the self-sovereignty of people. Finally, it's being put back into our hands. And I think this is something that a lot of people don't realize, like the power that it can have um, and that this kind of new technology brings to artists, to what we've seen in the art space recently is, you know, all these artists who were never even able to pay rent now suddenly are able to make a living for themselves. And I think, the same will happen with fashion. Right now we have all of these, you know, uh, interns slaving away for big brands, trying to make it, trying to climb up that ladder, trying to go into a, a hierarchical system that's been created. Um, yeah, not for the benefit of human beings, I can tell you, because um, I, I've been to fashion school. Um, but it is, it is, I think actually it's way more about giving the agency back to the people themselves and for them to create their own reality. and to be able to monetize of that and create these new micro economies and these new communities and building that together rather than it being um, yeah, one person saying this needs to happen. And also part of that is challenging value systems and totally. to create different values. So I think that's so interesting because that enables them. Because it, it's, it's like we also worked a lot in fashion over the years and I was always like, why is there just one person getting the credit? But there's all, there's all these amazing people the so talented, and the yeah. stylists, the you know Michelle Gobert doing the amazing music, and and now I think this is really going to change with this new dem democratization. So yeah. there will be also more and more anonymous artists in the end. I mean, uh, we had this totally. bank uh, in the recent years in the real world, but some more artists who will behave like this who will become some sort of monument mm -hmm. without knowing who they are. Yeah. And maybe sometimes it will be collective artists like this also yeah. in a collective way. So it, there is a, also a new perception of that that was experimented by them before. Totally. Moving mm -hmm. away from the, the lonely star artists and yeah. to the, yeah. the wider public, the collaboration. Uh, maybe you have questions, any questions regarding to... Yeah. Perhaps so many. I have to say, this was absolutely amazing. Is my voice loud enough? Can you give me a mic? I hate the sound of my voice on a mic. Really? Oh, really? <laughs> um, guys, this was absolutely amazing um, to listen to. I'm glad that I caught this. I, I'm so sorry I forgot your name, the lady on the right hand side. Um, Emma. Emma. Um, you're doing amazing work. And, Thank you, so um, much. you know, I love the way that you speak about it as well. Um, to what I think it was Melissa had said about the decentralization of the music industry, this blockchain, NFT, digitized um, fashion industry, it, it is more sustainable and yes, um, it certainly does feel like how the music industry decentralized. You mentioned that Vogue Singapore was the cover of um, on Vogue. Yeah. Uh, do you think the APAC region is more ahead of the curve? and the Western world in this movement that's happening within the fashion industry and digi-fashion and whatnot? Beautiful question, thank you. I think definitely um, they're ahead in terms of digital fashion and in terms of digital identity. I think for them it's way more easy to understand. Um, and I think also collaboration I think is uh, more of a thing uh, over there. It's more about the collective rather than the individual. So I think, um, in a sense, I think they're ahead. Um, but there is also a lot happening here right now. 
which I think is great, but I hope it will actually become more of a whole in which we work really together. Because um, that's why I love that we had so many di different designers from all over the world. And the same for the categories here that, that we're showing here and the, the films that we were playing this afternoon. It's from all over the world. And that's what I love so much about it. It's like, it's no longer the idea of us and them, but it's really we. And this is something that we haven't really seen before in, in, in times. And I hope that this will become more and more and more. It will be, will be less about this group that does this, and the other group does that, but you no, know, actually we operate as one human race. And, you know, like, uh, I think, um, yeah, but I think definitely, this region is definitely in France, I can tell you, and um, I think also because it, they're more comfortable with um, things being monitored, uh, data being given away, and here in, in the West, it's still uh, quite a big issue, and quite a lot of things in place to, to stop from that happening, yeah. That answers your question. Oh, definitely. I've got a gazillion questions if anybody asks. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, we'll chat after for sure. <laughs> Any um, other questions or reactions? Hello, everyone. Hi, um, I'm Lauren. I actually um, led the team and helped to create the first film that was shown tonight or today <laughs> during the afternoon. Woo! Yeah, thanks, guys. A really great conversation and I'm also really passionate about the same kind of values. How do we make a more sustainable industry? How do we empower um, ourselves to come together and co-create? So I'm really interested to see how this will progress because right now how do we kind of transform the industry from something where we have a few gatekeepers to something where we do all co-create and collaborate. So I guess I'm, my question is how do you see that moving? Do you see it to be kind of like a a fight or a struggle or how do you see that that future progressing um, interesting i think um i think it, it will be an interesting new development for brands to adopt to this new world because i think a lot of like what we've seen as well right now with a lot of things that are happening um a brand like gucci coming into roblox you know it, a lot of brands think like, okay, we just make a performance in, in, in Roblox or we do something in a metaverse and that's it. That's sort of how far we go and then we're, we're entering the metaverse. But I think a lot of these brands don't have the ethos or the values that are needed to create this new space. And especially coming, going from Web 2.0, which is all about like centralization, going into Web 3.0 for decentralization, Brands need to adopt that in order to survive because the same goes for Facebook. Like, if you know, most people that use Facebook right now are above um, 35, 40 years old, and if Facebook is going to build a metaverse, like, who is going to be going in there? It's not going to be the youth, <laughs> right? So, that where is this metaverse going to live then? They're all in Roblox or any other games or more games that are coming out, or maybe it's a game that doesn't exist yet. But those games operate on values. Like Roblox is something where you create games together and you play them together. And if, if a brand comes in and says, this is our experience and this is what you need to experience and then you consume, that is not really creating this new world. It is really about creating the new value systems. And I wonder if brands will be able to adopt to that. Um, I wonder and I hope they will be will be able to and I hope there will be space for that but yeah I'm also curious what you guys think on that topic as well um, I wanted to just say something more about how you were speaking about how we can change this um, and through democratization it's, it's through sharing the knowledge and that's something Amanda I've been watching how you're doing all of these workshops to share understandings of how young people can start creating in this sort of e-fashion world or digital fashion and so I think the ped pedagogical side of this is very interesting and how you can share that knowledge. I mean, all those workshops, a lot of my students are attending them and they're just like, th there's nobody else doing this. So I think this is really at the core of it is to um, give young people the tools so that they can make this work themselves and then set up their own systems of distribution, NFTs, um, metaverses, and not to have to rely on the Facebooks of the world because it is about these alternatives like independent music labels that can now exist on Bandcamp and, and so on. So yeah, it's about sharing. And so with, with our project also, we have um, theatre of making 
and this is a space of um, sharing knowledge about digital performance and improvisation in that space. So, yeah, yeah, this is part of theatre of making. We do um, two of those a year, um, and we, and that's also the inter interesting thing because you do break down sort of. Um, borders in a sense of people that are in, say, art school or not in art school. Um, we invite students from all over the world to join us in a sort of a, sh a shared campus, if you like. I hope you'll be one of our teachers soon. <laughs> yeah, with NFTs and... Okay, yeah, to answer, the, to get back to the question, the, um, the marketplace is definitely a, a spot that one has to work with. And that could be like a gatekeeper. So when one learns and when there are enough different marketplaces and different platforms, then it will be okay. But if one or two or three, like right now in the music business, three companies basically, and if they're just three, then it's, it'll be again like an oligopoly situation. But um, so what's important I think is right now also with this learning what Alex is speaking about is that the um, being able to also pop up quick marketplaces in sort of like po as pop-up shop situations that this technology will allow a, like wild like marketplace to happen and you know information and things to come and happen but of course it's a race right now to the closing in of something new if it's gonna be you know just Facebook then owning the whole metaverse <laughs> um, Another thing is interesting to see is when there's a lashback and demonizing of something new, like NFTs, which the art world is putting down all the time to say it's all very bad, all the NFTs are just such bad quality that art will never exist as NFTs. And so there are very amazing statements happening in printed magazines by like art experts, supposedly. So it's interesting to see that these people were completely not ready for it, a lot of them. I mean, of course, there's like digital art fairs and things that have been working with NFTs for years. Um, so, but like mainstream art galleries were so unprepared that now they have to put it down because the market's already taken off without them, like on the bandwagon. So, but I mean, they're all building up their NFT platforms, like as we speak, they have like a team of workers trying to do it. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's exactly the same in fashion. Because you know, you don't know how many um, ridiculed reactions you know we got when we first started doing digital fashion. You know, it's like, what? Everybody was like, why would you do that? Why? And and like, we have to touch it. We have to feel it. You have to like. And the most reaction was, you're gonna take away my job, and you know all these kind of things. It's it's a lot of based in fear, while it is not based in excitement. Mm -hmm. And I think. You know, that's maybe also what's going to happen, what's going to happen to all these art galleries that they're now all building platforms. Maybe this is all also what will happen to fashion brands who don't innovate. At some point they're running behind the bandwagon and you're already seeing that it's like, everybody's like sort of trying to get into the metaverse as fast as possible and create an NFT and, you know, because it's now cool to create NFTs, but what is really the point of it? You have to have a strategy for the long term. It's not just about short term gains of making so much money off a drop. No, it's about long-term change and not about the quick wins. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to follow on to that because you made a really good point. So last about... questions. <laughs> last sorry. question, no. <laughs> last question, sorry. Um, so you made a point about how some people were against um, I guess crossing over into that digi space. Um, I'm a child of the 80s and you know I revere designers with fabric, fit, all of those things. And you said, um, what is it for? Um, I mean, I can see the future of it, it feels very now actually, but for those of us who still want to feel that experience of wearing, say, your digitized dress, um, do you see an MTO model that's built on the marketplace? Do you see a, a, a space for something like this? Or do you think that, or do you see a one sort of tunnel vision of just being digitized and there not being a tangible aspect to it? Well, I think there's always a combination of things and I think there's a place for everything. Like there's people who, who uh, collect records, right? People collect records to have in their house and it's, very nice, it sits on a shelf and, and sometimes you play it. Uh, but next to that, everybody listens to Spotify. So it is this sort of 
way of getting away from the physicality of things. I mean, imagine traveling like me right now, I travel with a suitcase with, full of clothes. It's just clothes, because how impractical is that? Like, I'm just thinking about, I don't think this is a practical way forward into the future. You know, like, why wouldn't we wear something that's actually comfortable on our bodies, that fits nicely, that just feels really good and gives us a pleasurable feeling? And then over that, we can wear the craziest digital looks. I mean, if I would want to wear, um, you know, a dress that's 10 meters long, it will get caught in the metro, and it's very impractical. But if it's digital, it could be, right? And, and you could go to all of these boundaries and pass all of these fantasies and go into this new world. And I think that's really exciting. And I think there's always a place for this world that existed of these designers, because I think it's wonderful what they created and it's beautiful and it should be. And this will be an additive experience actually yeah. of yeah. breaking gravity, of breaking reality yeah. and going into the spectrum of fantasy. And I mean, it's yeah. like also absolutely amazing though to imagine that from this fantasy, it'll then swing back into this like materialism somehow. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting, you know, this looping or how the, you know, metaverse, how the digital world then like swings back into our reality here yeah. now. And like what you said, maybe we can just have one outfit so that that will save on all the production of cotton and all of these problems that come along with it. So yes, here's yeah. the metaverse. Yeah, okay. Thank, thank, you thank, you. So thank you. 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 Thank you.